It's time for Mid-American Gardener, and we are glad that you've joined us because this is when we talk about all things seasonal, all things that have to do with our panelists and whatever you have in mind for us. So thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. Now, let's find out who's here with me, and you can direct your questions towards their expertise. I'm going to throw it over to you first, Dr. Tom Voigt. Thanks, Diane. Hi, I'm Tom Voigt. I work in the Department of Crop Sciences, and uh, my uh, area of expertise is in uh, perennial grasses. So I work with lawns, uh, lawn grasses, ornamental grasses, prairie grasses, and all sorts of uh, perennial grasses. I have a, uh, a letter here, uh, a message here, uh, from New Lenox, um, so up near the uh, south, in the southwest suburbs of Chicago. I have had great success growing all kinds of fountain grasses over the years, but I never tried purple fountain grass because I was told they are not hardy here in Zone 5. Is this true? Would I need to dig them up in the fall? Uh, yes, that is true. Uh, f uh, purple fountain grass is uh, probably not hardy any place in, uh, in uh, Illinois. Uh, you'd have to go quite a bit south of here to uh, grow them as perennials. Uh, and in their native uh, uh, area, they are perennials, but that's quite a bit warmer than, than what we have here. Uh, so you can, uh, very often you see purple fountain grass grown with annuals because they, they, they're treated as an annual, so they're grown in containers uh, frequently, or they're grown with uh, bedding plants in, in, in the landscape. And you can can dig them up and overwinter them. Uh, uh, I don't know how successful you might be in a uh, um uh, in, in taking clumps and, and putting them maybe in a, in a dark uh, area. You have to keep them watered periodically. Um, it's not, not like storing a can uh, uh, or something. Uh, they're, also, they're sold every year, so you can replace them uh, pretty readily uh, with, with new, uh, uh, with new uh, purple fountain grass uh, uh, plugs or plants every, every spring. So. Okay. It's such a nice plant though. Oh, it's so. gorgeous and there's some new ones out there with mm -hmm. uh, more uh, different shades of red and different sizes. So yeah, it's a, it's a great accent plant in a, in a, in a container or in, a, in, in with a lower growing bedding plants. Okay, so grow it even if it's an annual. That's the take home message. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. And now in the middle, Dr. I'm going to say the whole name, Jennifer Schultz Nelson. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Diane. Uh, I'm Jennifer Nelson, and I'm a University of Illinois horticulture educator. And I brought a show and tell today. Uh, being fall, a lot of us buy pumpkins and other squash to put on our front porch, and that's actually where this one came from. Um, but we don't realize that we can eat them too. They're really attractive for the duration of the season. And as close as I can figure, this is something called a Cinderella squash. It came out of an assorted uh, squash pile at our local garden center. Uh, but one thing to remember when you do cook squash at home is that the outer rind is really thick and it can be dangerous to cut it with a, a big sharp butcher knife. But one tip um, that has come in handy in my house. <laughs> and it's no one's hit, leaning back. Yeah, no one, it's not to hit anyone with, but if you use a large butcher knife and get it started in the pumpkin, you're tempted to want to lean on that big knife and that's not the best idea in the world. But a rubber mallet at the base of the knife and smack it a few times will get that knife through the rind and safely cut it without cutting yourself in the process. We actually did a program where we compared uh, a pumpkin like this, this Cinderella squash or Cinderella pumpkin with alongside butternut squash and a couple other kinds. Everybody liked this better than the traditional butternut squash. They found it to be a lot denser and more buttery and just a lot richer flavor. So really? decorate with it and then eat it. Because butternut squash are very good. Yeah. And this was better. Yeah, we did three different squash besides butternut, and everybody preferred something other and than butternut. Does it keep as well? Because butternut squash will keep for a long time. Most of them will. And one tip is to make sure that you have a good chunk of stem attached when you buy them. Mm -hmm. uh, prevents the rot from getting into the punk or getting into the squash. Right. Quick. Very good tip, and it's really attractive yeah. as well. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And now, to my left is Dr. Phil Nixon. Hi, Phil. Hi, I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. That means I'm a bug guy. <laughs> and uh, have a letter from a listener. Wants to know, how do I prevent the little worms from infesting the next year's cherry tree crop? I've heard the little buggers hibernate under the soil during winter and come out when the tree is flowering. Chances are this is referring to the, uh, to the uh, spotted wing Drosophila. 
uh, had the adults picture just a second ago, and now the larvae. A larvae will get up to, oh, about uh, 3 sixteenths of an inch long, something along that line. Uh, they have shown up about two or three years ago in, in Illinois and throughout the Midwest. And they have, uh, they become very, very numerous and get into most of our berry fruits as well as, as cherries and, and can't even get into tomatoes, uh, a variety of different types of, of fruits uh, associated with that. And really for, for a homeowner, probably the best thing you can do is to clean up overripe fruit. This is what will really increase their numbers. They have a very sh a short life cycle, only a couple, three weeks. And so uh, if you can, if you can uh, clean up and destroy the, uh, the overripe fruit, the rotting fruit, this will greatly reduce the numbers and will greatly reduce the numbers from year to year. And so that's the best thing. Uh, if you, and that many times is all you need to do. Uh, research has shown that that will normally keep the numbers down to where um, they're not really, uh, really a problem. Uh, you can use some insecticides, some fruit f sprays, if you wish, or spinosad, uh, which is sold as uh, bullseye insecticide, uh, will give you, give you some more control. But generally, just picking up the, the, the uh, overripe fruit to drop fruit and getting rid of it rather than letting it lay there, that just uh, greatly increases the number of these, uh, of these flies and, and the worms, that, the maggots that come afterwards. Okay, very thorough. Good job. All right, let's go to next, a special did you know. Tree leaves are composed of many colored pigments. Green chlorophyll hides them during the spring and summer growing seasons, while shorter days and cooler temperatures in the fall cause the chlorophyll to break down and the other pigments to be seen. And a beautiful fall it has been with fall color. It's very nice. Let's go to the phone lines and start with Bob's question on line one about fall grass. Hi there, Bob. Good evening. Uh, what my question is is about just regular lawn. Okay. Uh, what is the proper length to be cutting your grass in the fall? And how much fertilizer, that type of stuff should you put on? I love this question. Well, Bob, that's a great question. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, people that want to cut their grass very short at the end of the fall. Uh, I would maintain it at the normal height, which I would recommend between two and three inches for most of our lawn grasses uh, uh, here uh, in Illinois. Um, so that, that would be the proper height. If you do want to cut it short uh, um, to clean it up, I would do that in the spring uh, before the onset of growth. So right before it starts growing in, uh, in probably in late March or early April is the time when you'd want to, uh, to cut it short. Regarding fertilization, uh, we would recommend uh, a, uh, a holiday fertilization schedule for your turf, uh, 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 starting with uh, an application at Mother's Day in May and another application at Labor Day in, in uh, early September. And the third the application should be coming up any time now uh, uh, around Election Day or Veterans Day. So that would be sometime in the first half of November. Um, if you do water your lawn, you could add a Flag Day or a, a, a mid-June. Mid <laughs> sometimes I struggle to find holidays when I'm when I think I'm you're trying. doing well. So, so a kind of a mid-June uh, fertilization if in fact you're uh, irrigating your lawn. If you don't irrigate your lawn, I would, uh, uh, I would uh, avoid uh, uh, fertilizing mm -hmm. it in the, in the summer period. I think the holidays help you remember. Helps me. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say it, I only slightly forget it until I, and then I think, oh yeah, that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob, for that yeah. question and for your answer for, um, for him. Now let's go to line two and Brad has a question. I think about Amaryllis. Hi, Brad. Hello, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I have Amaryllis and the bulbs are getting smaller. I am using them. Um, bone meal, uh, I did this spring a little bit at each one, and I let the leaves uh, die back, but they, they aren't getting very big, they're staying small, and they're not blooming either, so what should I do? Well, are they getting adequate sun during the growing season? Where do you have them during the summer? In full sun. Mm hmm. Outside. And adequate water. Yeah. Sounds like you're doing everything right. You might try a more balanced fertilizer instead of just the bone meal. You know that 
that could be it. If you had the nitrogen, then that would make the leaves grow better. Right. They, they are talking about doing a balanced fertilizer for bulbs, and amaryllis is one right. big bulb when it starts. It wouldn't be pot bound, would it? Uh, oh, I don't know. Is it, is it, do you have adequate room in the question. pot for it? Um, they, some are pot bound, yeah. Uh -huh. Sometimes that can be good for amaryllis, right, though, in, in getting it to flower. But I would, hmm. I would try changing the fertilizer personally. So try that and then report back. <laughs> so hopefully that would work. But they are saying a balanced fertilizer for bulbs, especially the hardy fall bulbs. But this one probably Actually, too. Actually, I the last uh, bulb fertilizer I bought, there was mm -hmm. one available with not just and phosphorus. I, I think that came out of the. Uh, that's been a little while, but came out of maybe North Carolina State, okay. I think, so you might check into that. Okay, thanks for your question. Let's go to Sandra's question on line three about knockout roses. Hi there. Hi. What's your I would question? I'd like to know if I should let my knockout roses die off or cut them back. Oh, this is another <laughs> good question. What do we want to tell her about cutting roses at this time of the year? Leave them alone. Don't do it. Okay, who would like to answer the, would you, I would Jennifer? say leave. I would say leave them alone. They'll give you some winter interest and uh, you can get some rose hips developing, which mm -hmm. are really beautiful over the winter. And depending on what kind of a winter we have, if it's harsh again, like last year, you can have a lot of winter kill. And if you've cut everything back, you may lose the entire, entire rose. That's kind of a, a hard thing to happen with knockout roses. They're pretty hardy, but hedge your bets and leave it until spring and see what you're left with after the winter. Okay, thank you, Sandra, for that. And Jennifer, let's do one more question and then we'll go back to uh, some emails. Julie on line five, what's your question? Hi, Diane. Hi. We really appreciate your program. Thanks. Um, I was asked to create some fall centerpieces and I thought it would be such a great idea just to collect some acorns from our local park. Mm -hmm. I thought that would be a nice touch to add to the table display. And shortly after I put the display together indoors, we noticed these little worms hatching from the <laughs> acorns and crawling across the tabletop. Oh, Could Phil's you, loving this question. Yeah, I knew he would. Could you explain <laughs> where they come from? And I have another a two part to this question. If you collect pine cones, I've heard that you're supposed to put them in the oven for uh, a short period of time at 250 degrees in order to get any of the bugs off. Can you do the same thing to acorns? Uh, the uh, the worms coming out of the acorns are are acorn weevils, and uh, they're kind of cute little bugs. They're uh, they're only about a quarter of an inch long or less, and have a real long uh, proboscis sticking out, uh, at least as long as the as the rest of the insect. And they will lay their eggs in the in the acorns uh, as they're developing. And there's a pecan weevil for pecans and and, and other hickories uh, as well. And uh, these will uh, their their main way of going through life is once the uh, once the eggs are laid while the, while the nut is still on a tree. But once it falls, then the then the fully developed uh, larva, uh, legless larva, white will 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 come out of the acorn. And, uh, and ideally get into the soil to spend the winter. And uh, there's been lots of stories of, uh, of little kids with uh, large numbers of uh, larvae crawling out from under the bed where they stored their shoe box full of, full of acorns uh, or hickory nuts. But, uh, but really uh, there's not, you could probably, uh, probably heat them. I don't think you need to go to 250 degrees. Generally getting up to 130 degrees and holding it for 30 minutes will, will kill any insects or any insect stages associated with it. You start getting too much higher and you're starting to get into the pop popcorn range <laughs> and you will have your, your acorns popping in the oven. So, uh, <laughs> so the uh, you know, moisture inside, hard shell on the outside means pop uh, when you get hot. So, uh, so up to about 130 degrees uh, would be a good idea for about, once you get them up to temperature, hold them for about a half an hour and that will pretty well uh, toast anything inside without popping the nut. Okay, so there you have it. And there's so many weevils for each kind. That's Oh yes. That's great. It's easy to find a lesser of two weevils there. Oh. <laughs> but I don't. Oh, boom. <laughs> you hey, are, bug people only have so many jokes. I know that's true. And I'm so happy I could help you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> you owe me 50 cents. All right, so <laughs> let's go back to uh, each of our panelists and we'll start with you, Tom, if you have a 
email, maybe? Well, uh, I have a letter here from Anne Marie and Roger. It, uh, doesn't or uh, email, and it doesn't indicate uh, where where they live. But they're talking. Uh, they're writing about true pampas grass. Uh, uh, true pampas grass. Uh, they have uh, several nine-year-old clumps in their yard. Uh, and earlier uh, in the year, Roger um, cut it back with a chainsaw. And and uh, I think. Uh, um, that uh, Anne Marie might have been questioning that, and, and I, uh, we like big chainsaws to cut back big, big clumps of grasses. So that's good. <laughs> that's an appropriate tool for the job. Uh, so we need to have uh, eye, eye protection on there. And tr uh, some training, and, you know. And some not training, the... uh, so, but but it's a good way to go after the uh, go after a big clump of grasses. And then it uh, they what they found was that the center of the uh, grass had died out. Um, it formed a donut or a crown with live tissue around the perimeter of the clump and the dead tissue on the inside. And that's pretty common. There's a lot of grasses that over time will will do that. Um, and you can revitalize that by dividing it. Now this may, in large clumps of grasses, this may be a difficult uh, uh, chore to dig up a large clump. And then I, you can divide that in pie-shaped wedges. Uh, you might get uh, eight or 10 pie-shaped wedges out of a big clump of grasses. They can be, be replanted and that will re, uh, rejuvenate that. Uh, a couple things about pampas grass. This is the true pampas grass they're talking about, which is native to uh, South America, the pampas region, the grasslands region in South America um, and so that's a uh, uh, it's, it's rarely grown in Illinois because it's not it's not hardy uh, it'd have to be uh, pretty far south in Illinois or south in our viewing area to, to grow a nine uh, grow at nine years or or in a pro very protected spot uh, um, uh, because it's it doesn't have great cold tolerance compared to a number of the other grasses that we grow we do grow another type called the uh, true or, the, or excuse me the hardy pampas grass mm -hmm. uh, uh, Saccharum ravenna and that one is uh, uh, hardy throughout Illinois, but it's not as pretty as the, as it's the true. It's really tall. Right. It's a, it's, it gets a very large uh, flowering stem on, mm -hmm. on that. So it might be 12 or 13 feet, 14 feet tall. It's pretty, flower. but not right. as pretty right. as the, the what true, they were The true pampas grass, uh, Cordideri, is a very pretty, right. uh, much prettier grass, I think. Okay, so Roger's off the hook. I think Roger, get a bigger saw for next year, Roger. So, <laughs> so, so. We do like the whole idea of it. That's really fun. All right, so let's go next to you, Jennifer. Okay, I have an email here that says, how should I encourage blooms naturally in potted plants? Well, there's a few things you can do uh, just without any kind of, of extra fertilizer. One thing would be to deadhead if your plant is already blooming, just go ahead and remove the blooms as they start to fade. That will encourage more blooms. Also make sure that your plant's getting enough sun. Most flowering plants need close to full sun and if you have them in the shade they're going to naturally bloom less. Uh, if you're not fertilizing already or if you are fertilizing, check that you're not adding too much nitrogen. If you're adding a high nitrogen fertilizer, you're going to encourage leaves at the expense of flowers. If you had, to, had a choice, use a balanced fertilizer or try to find one that has higher phosphorus in it, which if you're looking at the numbers, would be the middle number. You want that middle number to be higher. And if you do all those, those things, you should be able to get the best bloom for your buck. Excellent. Very well done. And now let's go on to you, Phil. We have a uh, letter from a listener saying that I have ground hornets. What is the best way to kill them? Their sting really hurts. Uh, chances are these are yellow jackets, probably the eastern yellow jackets, which unlike the German, which used to be very numerous, have spots on, that have spots on, on the abdomen. The eastern yellow jacket does not have spots. Uh, the eastern yellow jacket is a native uh, native wasp and uh, commonly the eastern yellow jacket will nest underground. The German yellow jacket, of course, is not native, tends to nest inside the walls of houses. We've been seeing an increase in the eastern yellow jacket kind of riding the ship from the German yellow jackets getting into Illinois and the rest of the Midwest in the early 1980s through the mid 1980s. They've kind of held court for about 30 years and now the eastern yellow jackets seem to be coming back to the fore. Uh, they will nest in, in the soil underground. You can have a couple thousand in one of these nests at this time and they do sting relatively readily. The good news is that that nest will die out as winter comes when we get to first week of temperatures where the high is no higher than 45 degrees Fahrenheit. The nest will die out. Only mated females will overwinter to start to nest next year from a single individual. 
And so, uh, and so your best bet is to give them time, uh, mow in other areas around there. If you need to mow that area, do it later in the evening and at the last thing and then get out of there. Uh, the, uh, if you want to eliminate the nest, uh, you can flood the nest with a mixture of permethrin. This will be sold as aid insect, insect spray and other brand names. Mix it in a, in a bucket according to directions. Uh, come, go out in the evening when you can still see it without uh, using a flashlight, but towards, towards sunset and uh, pour that into the nest, have a shovel full of soil ready to throw in there and then run like heck. Uh, <laughs> they will try to come out and kill you, quite frankly. So uh, usually the better thing to do is to just kind of let time take its course. And it takes till about now that they really build up and be very numerous. So, so that's a factor. And here's your 50 cents for the weevil pin. Oh! <laughs> Oh, this is great. <laughs> the big bucks are oh, flowing. Yeah, well, big bucks. <laughs> spare no expense. <laughs> I will set you up the next time if I know what of your other, of the two jokes that you have. I will set yeah, you up for the next. Yeah, I have a time remembering the other <laughs> Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to the phone lines for a call from Richard on line four about hydrangeas. Hi there. Hi. Uh, this is my second year with a hydrangea, and luckily it bloomed this year. Excellent. And I want to know what to do with it. We winterize it. What do I need to do? Okay, winterizing hydrangea. I don't do anything to Get mine. out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> Leave it alone. Don't cut it back until mm -hmm. you look at it in the spring and see what's actually sprouting. And this is another thing that if you cut it back now, you may just, winter may just wipe it out completely. Yeah. The only time I ever remove anything is just to get a flower head. It's a dried mm -hmm. one, but there's really nothing much to do. Isn't that a great answer? Yeah, less so work. <laughs> just wait till spring, and then you could just clean up those flower heads, mm -hmm. you know, because you wouldn't, they probably won't last and look so great in the spring. You might have some of the stems above ground survive if you're mm -hmm. lucky, and then you'll have even more flowers. That's true. Okay, so thank you for that question. We appreciate it. Now let's go to a little mag quiz feature next. Some plants act as natural bug repellents. Which of these flowers can help fend off damaging insects from your tomato plants? A, marigolds, B, petunias, C, black-eyed Susans. A. Marigolds. Commonly grown as ornamental border plants, marigolds are hardy annual plants which have a distinctive smell, which mosquitoes and some gardeners find particularly offensive. Okay, well let's do a quick last question and we're going to talk about asparagus. Line two with Jerry. Hi there, Jerry. Hi. I planted asparagus in my garden about three years ago, and I'm not sure what, it, what I'm supposed to do in the fall. I've been cutting it back after it dies off. Mm -hmm. uh, am I doing that correctly? Yeah, that, that sounds about right. It really died back, died off this year. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but, but yes, and I've just fertilized quite heavily in January, February, mm -hmm. you know, once you've cut everything completely off. So it's a really heavy feeder, um, composted manure, something like that. Um, that, that's pretty much I remulch yeah. if it needs to be and definitely get weeds, mm -hmm. perennial weeds for sure. It can be a real problem if they get started. Anything else you can think mm -hmm. of? Mm -hmm. But you will want to have it all completely cut back. But if it's still green, I let it go into the winter. But then it's harder to get cut back. <laughs> and last year it was hard because there was 18 inches of snow on it. That was a little trickier than usual. So anyway, uh, it just those patches just get better and better each year. So wait till you get those um, asparagus the size of your thumb. That's really, really worth it. Okay, well, that was a very quick question. Is there anything we should be doing in the fall season that we should let our viewers know to end uh, the show? I would kind of comment on the, on the mag quiz that okay. uh, uh, marigolds are, some types of marigolds are effective in keeping away nematodes, which we really don't Excellent. have a problem with in the Midwest. They actually attract many kinds of insects. They are not insect repellent. So they I've will, never heard of it. It's the, uh, the very 
commonly called a companion plant, but I don't know. Some not really. The, the yellow and orangish flowers will attract aphids oh. by the billions. All I yellow mean, flowers a, seem yes. to attract. In, so uh, the, We use uh, yellow pads in the greenhouse with stick them on it to attract all kinds right. of insects. So, so I will calmly tell people, if you want to have a, have a border of marigolds to make Arden look nice or fine, don't use it as an insect repellent. I make them to look fine. So we have uh, the mag quiz is sent in by all kinds of panelists, so you'll get all kinds of information yeah, and... It's commonly thought that way and somehow it got from nematodes to insects. I don't know how yeah. what it did. So for nematodes. All right, well, my goodness, the show goes fast. Thank you three for being on and thank you for watching. We hope you have a great week gardening. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>